Okay, well, I'm Thomas Beatty. I work for um, an independent uh, science consultancy agency and we offer our services to basically uh, stock market analysts. We try to make models that predict uh, how stocks and bonds and so forth will move with the market. Professor Horowitz was my uh, thesis supervisor. And, uh, well, I guess you want to know, uh, he's been in the news a little bit lately, so I guess you want to know uh, a little bit about how I met Professor Horowitz or how we worked together. Um, probably the story you want to hear most about is the one in Buenos Aires, which uh, a few people will, will have heard of. Um, we were travelling to Buenos Aires for the World uh, Mathematics Congress, where I was going to defend my thesis, and we were also going to present some, some new data that we'd been working on. And when we were catching the flight uh, down there, I turned up with my bag, my suitcase, and so on, everything I thought I'd need. I was going to take a little bit of a holiday. And he uh, turned up at the airport with just a plastic bag, with uh, a pad of paper, a pencil, and a pencil sharpener, so that he could work on the plane. And that was all he had. So we're sitting in the press conference, I'm at the back, and um, somebody asks him, OK, so what does this mean? The mathematician in question, he, he's going to receive this big prize. And I could see that was already a little bit annoying, that they were not focusing on you know, what that would do for the scientific world, but rather on what it meant for the, for the mathematician himself. And there was a question that, that sparked him off, and it may even have been a translation issue, where the interviewer asked about a billion or a million, so like in French we have a, a milliard, which is a billion but can be translated as a million. So it may just have been a translation issue, but he, Professor Horowitz, thought, okay, this person understands nothing. They know nothing about maths and they know nothing about science. And that made him a little bit angry, and he, he, he shot back to the interviewer, okay, do you even, can you even conceptualize what a million is? Do you have any understanding of the nature of numbers? And, uh, and the interviewer said, okay, and, 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 before, before the interviewer had a chance to, to ask something back, he said, okay, I mean, do you even know what a million is? Can, do you know how long it would take uh, a person to count to a million? And uh, I mean, do you know how long it would take? How long would it take? It would be 11 and a half days, and that's if you're quick. And um, so he just started counting in the press conference. And for the first minute, it was funny. There was a bit of nervous laughter. People understood that he'd made his point. But um, he didn't stop, and he just kept counting. And maybe 20 minutes went by, and okay, people started to leave, and uh, he realized he wasn't going to stop. But uh, the police came eventually for some sort of breach of the peace uh, and, and took him away. But he was still counting and still counting. And that was the last I saw, because I had to fly back the next day. And uh, I changed my job when I got back. I'd already found a new job. And uh, he was not somebody who, with whom I had a great deal of correspondence. I mean, he was a great man, but not a, a great conversationalist. So yeah, I mean, he was, he was retreating more and more into himself, but at the same time having these, these battles with, um, with the university. I mean, one of the things that he believed was that any proof that he made, any of the work that he'd done, any of the papers that he was publishing, should be completely freely available. I mean, even before publication, that's normally the way it works. You publish your paper, it becomes, you know, part of the common good, if you like. But he wanted to bypass that completely and just make all of his work available. This rubbed a few people up the wrong way, this idea of uh, freedom, freedom of information. And at the same time, with these battles constantly, he started to uh, withdraw more and more into himself. So yeah, I think that, that may have been the, the trigger, I don't know if it was something that was already in him, but that was certainly a trigger for his, for his descent, if you like, his decline. And his work started to be less and less, uh, you know, occasionally still brilliant, but less and less relevant, and he became interested in, you know, unusual theories and some might say sort of crackpot maths. The thing is, what you have to understand about mathematicians is that they're not necessarily like everybody else. They, um, you have to recalibrate your thinking of what constitutes normal behavior with them from other people. If people asked him questions and he felt that they didn't have the capacity to understand them, he would you know, fly into a rage. I never saw him uh, you know, strike anybody, but you could see there was a bit of suppressed rage. Well, not, not even suppressed, he would, he would shout and, 
and scream and, and I never saw him drink. I think he liked to be in control. But I mean, he wasn't. Maybe he did, but uh, I never saw it. We never went out for a drink. He wasn't the kind of guy that if you, that you would go out for a drink with. So if he did drink, he was doing it at home. I mean, I think he. As I said, he, he he's not the kind of person that you would just call up to have a chat with and talk about the the weather or the football. But he. He's even less uh, reachable, and I don't think he's—I don't think he's coming back, uh, which is a terrible shame for him. Not that—not that he had like a family or uh, or a group of friends who would be sad for him, but just for for the world in general, he could have done some brilliant things, and it's sad to see him lose it so comprehensively.